Another country that's not taking its cues from Western ideas about how to run a legitimate government is China. Chinese President Xi Jinping said recently to the Prime Minister of Greece, quote, your democracy is the democracy of Greece and ancient Rome, and that's your tradition. We have our own traditions. To help us understand what these traditions are and how they translate themselves into a different political culture, we welcome, in Beijing, China, via Skype, Daniel A. Bell. He's a Montreal-born Canadian political philosopher who lives and teaches at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And Daniel, it's great to be in touch with you tonight, 12 hours ahead of us uh, in Beijing, China, as you are. Let me just start with that line from Mr. Xi's where he said, we have our own traditions. What do you think he means by that? Well, they have a long tradition of selecting and promoting their own leaders. And basically, we could describe it as political meritocracy, whereby the idea is that if it's a large country, uh, the way to choose the top level leaders is we want them to be competent and virtuous. And then how do we measure that? Well, there's been a long debate in Chinese history, but basically, the, the, the method, which was the case in imperial history, and it's being revived now the past two or three decades, is first you have examinations to choose leaders, and then you have, based on performance at lower levels of government, uh, and you select and promote leaders. At, uh, and, and then it's a very rigorous process until the point where they become top leaders, and it's two or three decades later. They have lots of experience. I mean, the, all the leaders on the Standing Committee Politburo now have managed equivalent of countries the size of Canada before they were appointed to the Standing Committee of the Politburo. All right, that's their tradition. Uh, obviously, we in the West have a, a different tradition. Uh, we've had examples, for example, Brian Mulroney was Prime Minister of Canada, having almost no electoral experience at all. Uh, pretty much the same for Stephen Harper, uh, the current Prime Minister, almost no electoral experience before he got the job. Uh, you've looked at them both. You got a, an opinion on which system's better? I really think it depends on the political culture as well as the size of the country. I mean, if there's a country with no political culture of political meritocracy, then the alternative to democracy is military dictatorship. But if the country has a long history of political meritocracy, it's much easier to institutionalize. As well as in a large country, there's no one-size-fits-all solution for selecting and promoting leaders. At the lower levels of, uh, of government, it makes much more sense to have a democratic method whereby the people know the character of the leaders they choose, the issues are not so complicated, if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world, and the leaders are expected to have more direct contact with the people. But at higher levels of government, a large country of you know, 1.3 billion people, at that point, there shouldn't be the same method of choosing leaders as, as is used for choosing lower level leaders, and that's where political meritocracy becomes much more important. So again, in Canada, you know, it's, I mean, it's much smaller than China, obviously, both, I mean, at least in terms of population. Um, so the idea that there's one size fits all solution for choosing leaders might well be appropriate in Canada, but it's definitely not appropriate in China. Given the rigorous process that you described that China goes through before it settles upon a, uh, an ultimate leader, can you tell us what they must have thought when the United States picked Barack Obama, a man with a whopping what was it? Did he have a year and a half's experience in the Senate by the time he uh, decided to run for president? What must they have thought of that? Well, again, um, obviously Obama is, is very brilliant and, and capable leader, but because he had lack of experience, he made all these beginner's mistakes, which even his supporters acknowledge, which probably wouldn't be the case in China. Another thing in China is that there's collective leadership. So even if there's one leader who isn't as capable or as experienced as the others, um, his uh, views would be checked by, by the others. Um, so so, so, so I, 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 in that sense, I, there, there is a clear difference. I want to play a clip for you now from a professor of international relations at Fudan University. His name is Zhang Weiwei, and he's going to weigh in on this, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. To be frank, the China model is more about leadership, while the liberal democracy model seems more about showmanship. China is now capable of planning for the next generation, while the other model planning for next election or next 100 days. China's meritocracy system indeed challenges this stereotypical dichotomy of democracy versus autocracy. From the Chinese point of view, the nature of a state, including its legitimacy, 
has to be defined by its substance, that is, by good governance, with competent leaders and measured by what state can deliver and to what extent people are satisfied. What do you think of his comparison of our showmanship versus China's leadership? Well, it's true that in China, you couldn't be elected based on the basis of one or two good speeches or else good performance in, in some non-political way. Um, so in that sense, there's less emphasis on, on showmanship. Um, but I'm not sure I would fully agree that there's only one source of legitimacy in China. That is what, what, what we would call performance-based legitimacy. I mean, I think there are several bases of legitimacy. And maybe this is a bit different than in the West. It's not just Canada. When we think that the one source of legitimacy is the consent of the people. If the people have chosen the leaders, then the leaders are legitimate. But in China, that's one source of legitimacy. I mean, I think democracy is a source of legitimacy, but there are many other sources, including performance legitimacy, including nationalism, and including political meritocracy. And they all work together at different times in different ways. So uh, perhaps the one area in which I would disagree with Professor Zhang Weiwei is his implication that there's only one source of legitimacy in China. Well, there may be one thing missing from that list you just gave, and that is the so-called princelings in China, the sons of old revolutionaries who somehow managed to reach positions of high responsibility in the Communist Party. That, that doesn't sound like necessarily deep training or meritocracy getting you to the top that way, is it? Um, well, it's true that you know, every system is imperfect, um, but even the princelings, so-called, those who have political connections, um, it, it may have helped their ascent to power, but uh, they were, uh, certainly they wouldn't have gotten so far had they not showed confidence. And to a certain extent, virtue in the sense that they weren't corrupt. The problem with the system is that there was a basic implication or basic understanding that if you're from an important political family, the competent ones would go into politics and the others would go into business. And they didn't realize that the others who went to business would draw on their polit political connections to mass huge fortunes, which would in turn undermine the legitimacy of the political leaders. So that's a big problem in China now, is that the family uh, leader, the families of political leaders amass huge fortunes through political connections, and they're the ones who actually are not so competent. So I think there's an, a very much a need to crack down on, on this uh, kind of informal arrangement, which, which has been operating for the past two decades or so. Well, of course, the New York Times was all over that story over the past year where Wen Jiaobao, uh, somehow, as a, um, <laughs> somehow as a political figure in China, winds up amassing a fortune of at least $2.7 billion uh, while doing the people's business. Um, you know, how well, does that again, happen? It, well, again, it's not him, it's his own, it's family members. Mm -hmm who drew on his political connections to amass fortunes. And there was an, and they didn't realize that that would undermine the legitimacy of the political leaders who themselves may not be so corrupt or actually so concerned with the pursuit of material goods. So, so now the clear, uh, the, perhaps that, that's, that's the, the very important source that undermines the legitimacy of the leaders in China. Because in a meritocracy, the leaders are supposed to be both capable and virtuous. And virtuous Virtue at minimum means that they should serve the community, not their own interests. And if they amass huge fortunes, obviously that undermines that source of legitimacy. So it's a very strong incentive to crack down on corruption in China because it undermines their legitimacy, which may not be true actually in a democracy. Because in a democracy, the leaders get their legitimacy by virtue of the consent of people. If they're corrupt, then in a way it's the people's fault. They can, and if the leader, but in China, so they really have to crack down on, on corruption. And, and the big problem is not so much the leaders themselves, but rather the family members who drew on political connections to, under, to, to amass these huge and, uh, and um, to be frank, morally obscene fortunes. Mm -hmm. Daniel, I'm not sure this story made much waves in China, you can tell me, but certainly over here in Canada, uh, it was a bit of a big deal for a while. And that is the current leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, Justin Trudeau, was asked during a Q&A session one night, uh, the country he admires most in the world, and he said, China. He said, there's a level of admiration I actually have for China. Their basic dictatorship is actually allowing them to turn their economy around on a dime. Uh, first things first, is what he said accurate? It's partly accurate. I mean, if there's a major economic crisis like the financial crisis, then it's easier for Chinese leaders to deal with it in, 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 a, in a fast and effective way. 
But on the other hand, I mean, part of the benefits of a political meritocracy, as Zhang Weiwei said, is that they're not so concerned with the next electoral cycle, which means that they could plan for the long term. So they have these five-year plans and, and sometimes longer plans, which set the agenda. So, and they're not supposed to be changed on, on a whim. And um, so, so in that sense, it's not accurate. Another sense, which perhaps is not so accurate, is that one of the interesting uh, parts of the Chinese political system is that there's a lot of experimentation below the level of the central government. So they don't just decide, wow, let's just immediately switch to a new, new social, economic, or political system. They try it out at lower levels of government. If it works well, then they could generalize it to the rest of the country. And if it doesn't work well, then they stop those experiments. At least in principle, that's how it works. And often it has worked that way too. So, so it's not like there, it's like a dictators who just decide, you know, let's, decide, let's just decide to switch. There's these long-term planning, there's experiments. The only time in which these very fast switches become important is in times of economic crisis. I want you, uh, if I may, to give us a little insight into, uh, for lack of a better expression, a family feud that takes place within your family. And that is, if I have this right, your Chinese father-in-law and your mother are very much not on the same page when it comes to how big a nation should be or whether Quebec should be in or out of Canada. Explain if you would. <laughs> well, well, I'm from, I'm, I'm, I'm from Montreal and my mother is Francophone and she has been a, a supporter of Quebec independence. So when I mentioned that to my father-in-law, he was quite horrified. He's an old soldier who fought in three wars. Um, and basically, you know, throughout most of the 20th century, China viewed itself as a country that was bullied by foreign powers and, and, and split into smaller places. And basically, you know, the important source of legitimacy of the Communist Party is that they successfully unified the country. So they're not very sympathetic to efforts to, uh, to separate. So when I, and of course it also invokes echoes of Taiwan. So when I mention uh, the case of my mother and the importance of linguistic identity and how perhaps there might be the need for a nation to maintain that linguistic identity, he, he didn't quite get it. Um, it should be said that you know the idea of a, of having a separate country to to maintain and promote uh, one's own language is is a bit odd in a Chinese context. So the notion, well, certainly uh, Quebec sovereigntists see themselves as the underdogs in a struggle against the rest of Canada to have their own country or associated with Canada, however you want to describe it. This notion of rooting for the underdog, does that just not exist in Chinese culture? Uh, well, it, it, in politics, you have that. You know, for some, most of the Confucians throughout chi Chinese history, they emphasize that the first obligation of the government is to care for what today would call disadvantage. And for them, it means not just people who are poor, but people who lack key family relations, like widows and orphans. Uh, and, and so on. And, and there was direct aid from the government to, to people who are disadvantaged in that sense. Um, but when it comes to rooting for the underdogs, I guess it, we think of it more in the sports context. In that case, it's true that Chinese tend to root more for, uh, for example, in the World Cup, for countries which have a long history and tradition, and not so much for the, for the upstarts. Uh, and and that, that, I guess that's what, perhaps what I meant by, by that statement. Understood. In our last few minutes here, I want to ask you about information, because, of course, in a Western-style democracy, a so-called free press, the public's right to know how their government operates on their behalf, is one of the fun fundamental tenets of a Western democracy. Uh, clearly not the case in China. Do you see a point coming at some point in the future where the Chinese will uh, change their opinions about how information flows in their country? Well, yeah, yeah, again, look at it in context and compared to 20 years, I think there's much more information available now and the internet is the main reason. Um, and whether it's Wei Xin or Wei Bo, and including many political jokes, and there's lots of studies, you know, including criticisms directed at leaders. And, and recent studies show that uh, China is, is open when it comes to criticism political leaders, but it's at the point when there's uh, somebody urging collective organization and social protest. That's when that's when they crack down. So I think there's a need for the government to be more clear about what are the, the boundaries of what's permitted and what's not. I mean, they've all, they're all quite ex implicit so far. Um, 
To be honest, I mean, look, a political meritocracy has many virtues, as we're saying, long-term planning, don't worry about the next electoral cycle. But we have to make choices like any other political system. And a political meritocracy, the one constraint is that it can't allow for open one person, one vote, multi-party competition, because uh, that would undermine the whole system. So, so they just have to be clear and say, fine, you know, we're going to allow uh, political speech, but we're going to stop it at the point that it, it urges for uh, organized um, multi-party competition as a challenge to, to, to the dominant political system. I think if they were a bit more open in that way, it would, it would be helpful. Just out of curiosity, do you have YouTube in Beijing? Uh, well, uh, YouTube is blocked along with many other systems, but there's so many uh, ways to avoid the, uh, the blocked um, uh, systems. And so some of my students at Tsinghua are very, Tsinghua is, is one of the universities in Beijing where I teach, you know, help me to install those. those uh, I'm not very high tech myself, but it's, it's not uh, hard to get around. I mean, and you have, the, the, I mean, again, these are driven partly by political Reasons. I mean, the reason why YouTube was blocked was because uh, the, at, at the point that there were riots in Xinjiang two or three years ago, they worried that YouTube would be used to organize ethnic riots that would lead to, to violence. But there's also commercial reasons underlying, not just blocking YouTube, but Facebook, because you have competitors in China. In the case of YouTube, uh, there's, there's a local, you know, national competitor, very powerful company, same for for Facebook, and that's also part of what's driving th this whole thing. Is, is So it's both political and, to be honest, capitalist reasons that explain uh, the, the censorship system in China. But if I read you right, your students would prefer not to have those sites blocked by the authorities, and they would prefer a more Western-style, free, open exchange of ideas, websites, etc. Of course. I mean, any intellectual or critical person uh, doesn't doesn't want uh, those things blocked. When I do my own research, it's very frustrating sometimes. Um, yeah, so I, I went, so I had to go to Singapore the past year for a few months just in order to do proper academic research. So yeah, definitely. Understood. Daniel Bell, it's awfully good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Be well and thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.